Welcome everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Can you see that? Yes. Excellent. That's all we can do. So uh, my name is Nikita Ivanov. I'm, I'm actually one of the founders of this project. I mean, I wrote the first line of code of this project literally 10 years ago. Uh, actually, more than that. The first line of code was written in 2005. So what we're going to do basically today is I'll probably take about an hour of your time, and the idea is to give you kind of a high level overview of what Apache Ignite is. Um, just to preface that, the project was originally written in Java. And about uh, six, nine months ago, we released our basically natively implemented .NET version of that. It's not a client, it's not something you connect to, it's only this. It's a full-fledged .NET development that we've done to really you know, accommodate you guys, everybody who comes from a .NET ecosystem to our project. So, I'm going to talk about Ignite generally and what it is because obviously everything that's available for Java is available for .NET. There's absolutely API parent. There's nothing that is specific to Java or specific to .NET. So if you, as a matter of fact, we have pretty cool technology that I'll describe later on where you can actually reuse objects between Java and .NET ecosystem. But everything that I'll talk today, when I don't mention .NET, it actually applies to .NET. There's not a single feature in the product that is specific to Java or specific to .NET except for a few differences where I basically mentioned that. So we'll talk about all the different kind of, you know, uh, functional areas of a project. It's a fairly big project. If you look at the Apache ecosystem, uh, we are much bigger than Hadoop, for example, in terms of lines of code. It's a fairly large project. Uh, we cover a lot of different areas. Uh, but we'll talk about some of the project history, and we'll talk about what is the memory data fabric. That's what Ignite is. So we'll talk about the clustering, computer grid, data grid, service grade, streaming, and some of the Spark and integration, all of which is available today for that so Before we uh, jump into all this, I, I always kind of want to get, get on the same kind of uh, frequency with everybody. Why all of a sudden we talk about in-memory browsing? I know most of you heard about it, right? It's nothing dramatically new. Uh, we've had a memory processing since the first day of computers. Uh, literally, anybody old enough remember uh, one of the first computers ever, like in the early 50s, they already had memory, right? They already had a very specific memory. We always knew that if you put stuff in RAM, things go fast. The problem was the RAM was expensive, too small. That's why we developed all this, you know, you know, tapes and then disks and then flash and then whatnot else coming up. Why all of a sudden, you know, why we all knew about a memory for 50 plus years, all of a sudden in the last five to six years, this was really getting traction. This is basically, uh, Bit of a slide on the left and right of charts over there. So on the left is the data growth. You all know that I'm not going to spend any time on this. The data is growing exponentially, growing fast, and we all need to process this pretty much in real time. What's really fundamental for the growth when memory processing as a concept is the chart on the right. This is actually a price of DRAM. And as you can see, this is the price of DRAM, and the, the bottom one is the price of hard drive disk speed rust. As you can see, the RAM is still more expensive, but it goes in exactly the same trajectory as the price of hard drives, which is dropping about, you know, literally about 30% every year in terms of the price. Now, let me ask you a question. Imagine that you want to buy a cluster of computers with one terabyte of RAM design. One terabyte of RAM. Let's say it's a 10 blades. Each blade has a one terabyte of RAM, right? The total capacity of a cluster is a one terabyte. How much do you think it costs today? Completely honoring. How much? Half a million? Probably less. 250. 100K. Who's the 100K? 100K. 100K. Less than 20K. Think about this. Less than 20K buys a terabyte of RAM. Now think about this. About four years ago, the entire working set of Twitter, which is about seven days of all tweets, was about seven terabytes. So for the price of pretty well equipped Tesla, you can buy enough RAM, I'm talking about DDR4 RAM, capacity in the cluster, to, to keep the entire working set of Twitter in RAM and literally have any type of processing analytics in real time. So that's the kind of the lesson that the price of RAM, which was probably one of the most hard economic barriers for an American company, has really came down. It's not a problem anymore. I mean, aren't we here in Silicon Valley? I don't have to tell you how many times we speak like in a month with you know two or three guys taught us in a garage somewhere, you know, 
asking us about some questions about Apache Ignite. We're asking what the hell you guys do. Well, we just developed and we already have like, you know, 20 terabyte of data collecting every week. I don't know what it is, but you know, that's what's happening in a lot of companies here. So, the price, I mean, the, the demand is obviously there. Right? We, we all know this, right? We all work in some capacity for some of the big data and whatnot. But the economics is what driving this so, so badly. There was another basically a little bit of a technical, technological trick. You know, I remember, you know, five, not five, ten years ago, we only had 32 bits to use. There was a limit on how much RAM you can process on that 32 bits, 32 bits to use, right? Uh, today, your phones have 64 bits, 64 bits to use. This problem went away completely. So when you combine 64 bits to use in the last decade, plus the whole economic uh, story, that's why you see almost everybody jumping in an American computing bandwagon. So a couple of examples. Facebook is notorious to have hundreds of terabyte memory classes for all the online processing. Uh, what's up? Perfect example. Absolutely in memory first architecture. There's nothing on the disk in what's up. That's why they had a very small class support in literally a quarter billion, half a billion users on the on the cluster, basically people in this room. With about fifty people in total on a payroll. If you ask them why, they tell you basically the fundamental idea was to keep everything in RAM. It was entirely in a RAM company. It doesn't have to be anything like this. Uh, for example, we at Great Game, we see lots of banks, right? You can find lots of banks, basically, very traditional boring applications, you know, fraud protection, you know, back, off, back office building, uh, apps and whatnot. They basically use American Bidding. So, you'll see American Bidding almost everywhere. And that's basically what's really exciting this year. So, so, uh, what is a memory data time? Now, you've probably heard about in-memory caches, in-memory data grids. Uh, why all of a sudden we talk about in-memory data fabric? Why the different name? So the name is uh, really, you know, we thought about it pretty hard. And historically, historically, we didn't start with in-memory data fabric. We started with in-memory compute platform. So, and we'll talk about the compute grids. Then we added the compute, and then we added the data grids to the, to the fabric. And over the years, we start, we keep on adding different functional areas to the platform because because over the years the use cases for memory computing have matured enough and our customers are asking us more and more questions so basically uh, in memory data fabric is a software layer it's a middleware right it's traditional uh, traditional middleware it slides in between your traditional disk storage or any kind of storage as a matter of fact we now work with almost everything possible here so anywhere from Hadoop and HDFS you know, hundreds of NoSQL databases anywhere from Cassandra, Manga, and Couch, to all the disk base, and obviously all the structure data like SQL, or sometimes it's a flat out file system. So anything that basically sits underneath of us, we can bring this up into the in-memory layer across a large cluster, and the large canvas model, we'll talk about this in a second. And then you have multiple different APIs. The major APIs we have, Java, C++, .NET, and SQL. I mean, SQL probably apply applicable everywhere, uh, but fundamentally, two major APIs we have, Java 3, C++, and .NET. They're all different, they're all native. There's a little bit of a mistake here because there's no connection between C++ and .NET, unless you're working with C++ and .NET platform. Uh, we have three major native implementations for a, a runtime core. One in Java, one in C++, one in .NET. So fundamentally, one more time, the memory data fabric is a type of software you slide in between your basically underlying storage systems and new apps, and we bring you both speed and scalability. Now, this is important. It sounds like a pretty mundane, speed and scalability. Let me explain to you how we do this, because uh, it's not obvious. First of all, speed, right? That's actually pretty obvious, right? We're talking about in-memory processing. You put stuff in RAM. RAM is dramatically faster. But anybody can guess how much it is faster? It's over a 10 million times faster than a disk. Think about this. Unfortunately, your apps will not be 10 times even faster than, than a disk. You can lose a lot in a, in a transition. But uh, what's interesting is that RAM is really, really dramatically faster than a disk. So by putting stuff in RAM, you gain some speed. Scalability. Where does scalability come about? Uh, scalability comes from a parallelization. Most of you can probably ask, why the hell about parallelization in memory computing? What's the connection here? Let me tell you the pretty interesting story. You know, when I talk to uh, analysts who are actually new to this, analysts, they ask, 
confused as well in this, in this subject. Mm -hmm. Historically, historically, we started, the, basically, so I started in memory computing about in the late 90s when I first time got exposed to this. If you remember 15, 20 years ago, single computers would not have anything, in, would not have enough capacity in terms of RAM to do anything useful. So back then, you were forced to do distributed programming or distributed computing or distributed design for those systems. As a matter of fact, back in the 90s, almost any in-memory system, especially those in the Wall Street and the spec application like DOD and military, would be on the massive clusters. Because back then, how much RAM each plate would have? Maybe a megabyte. Remember? Maybe a couple of megabytes. Maybe 60 megabytes would be a very big plate. So in order to get anything useful out of this capacity, you have to string them together. That's why what's interesting is that in-memory systems today are one of the most sophisticated distributed systems in existence. For example, I can give you uh, Apache Ignite, the largest customer, or largest installation of Apache Ignite, runs of over 2,000 nodes in a full transactional topology. Now, you name me another software that runs on a clusters of that size. Hadoop, probably. Cassandra, no way. Maybe, 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 but it, it gets to the hundreds, it gets very complicated. So you will really find very, very few projects or a products that can physically run on that large capacity. And the memory systems were, from the beginning, we were forced to do it. Because even 10 years ago, we couldn't get any computers like today with the terabytes of RAM on a single machine. We had to basically string together a tens and hundreds of computers and we have to build our software to support that. That's why you see not only speed, which you can achieve in a single box, but you can also see scalability. And you know, over the years, we, we, we've come to use that ability to do very smart parallelization of a processing. That's why, for example, in, uh, in Apache Ignite, we have very, very nice compute grade, which I'll talk about in a second. But again, when we talk about a memory computing, that's what, you know, really, really confusing for a lot of folks who come and do here. It's not only about brute force speed. Yes, RAM is faster than disk, everybody knows it. Most of the mature memory computing systems also have very dramatic, sophisticated parallelization capabilities in, as well. And they typically run on a very large, or can run large costs. You don't have to anymore, but you can. Uh, when I say you don't have to, uh, what do you think the largest amount of RAM is available today in a single box? Okay, no. I mean, I'm not talking about special hardware. I'm talking about something you can buy off from the vendor. So we all know that you know Amazon right now has instances, I think, with two terabytes, right? Two terabytes instances like X1, you pay in a 13 bucks an hour for that. In and of itself, that's pretty amazing. Think about this. 13, that is say like 10 bucks an hour for a two terabyte instance. We recently completed testing for a Fujitsu M10. An M10 is an old Thalidus box. It has 64 terabytes of RAM. I'm talking about DDR4 on a single box. Think about this, 64 terabytes on a single, you know, pretty large, you know, service system. Um, and that's basically like, available oh, today, you can buy it from Fujitsu right there. It's basically sold only in Japan, I think outside of Japan, 32 max, but basically it's available. So, yeah, you, you kind of for, go forward, you know, two, three years from now, we're going to have a typical blade, so you're going to see funny in data centers with 16, 32, you know, uh, terabytes of RAM on the blade itself. So we rapidly, rapidly getting into the petabyte scales for memory systems, which we have already today in the large banks and large installations, but they're going to become much more uh, economical to begin. So, RAM is there. So let me actually go ahead and show you a different picture, a little bit of a different kind of slide. And what, how do we organize uh, underneath, of the, underneath of the, uh, under the hood? So fundamentally, we, we're, this is kind of a logical stack of things. I don't know if you can see from the back, but you know, we start with a very basic uh, cluster management. We support a lot of different things. We support our own clustering. We can also plug into the um, things like the Docker and the AWS and Doc uh, and Mesos. We just about announced our support for Azure. As a matter of fact, you obviously can run on Azure with a brand new license, but we just about to complete literally, literally within days to complete a, a one button click for Azure Marketplace. So you can go in Azure Marketplace, literally you know, plug into your account, click a button, say how many nodes you want to have, let's say five, click a button, boom, you have a five node plus running. Uh, so that's literally coming up maybe by end of this week, by the way. 
maybe early next week. So we're going to have that. So then basically on top of that, we have our own clustering capabilities. Very important, as I already mentioned many, many times, why it is important. On top of that, we have our what we call a tiered memory model. Uh, let me just stop here because we're not going to talk about this specifically. But tiered memory model is very, very important. Uh, essentially what it allows you to have, think about this, there are different types of storage. There's a RAM, right, which is very fast, but small capacity relative to, to what? The flash. Flash can be, well, it's cheaper than RAM, has more capacity, it's, and it's slower than RAM. And then there's a hard disk, which is basically basically free today, right? Most of the time, has large capacity, but it's extremely slow compared to flash and even compared to the RAM. So we have ability to move your data in the system. When you store the data into the Ignite, we have ability to move this data in the different tiers based on what you need. You know, we can keep it in RAM for fast if we have it. If we don't have it, we can push it to flash. If we don't have flash, we can push it to a disk. Fairly transparently for you. You don't really have to do much, but we have that. We have NCSQL online capabilities as well. And then we basically have a kind of a bifurcation between our and our function areas. Some of them really concentrate, let me just move to this slide. Some of them are really concentrated around the high volume transaction process like data grid computing and service grid, the kind of old transactional world. And we have you know analytical, you know, you know traditional OLAP stack with streaming and memory, can do in the DFS and memory in some of the uh, some of the integration with Spark. And on top of that, we have plenty of clients and we have native implementations. So we have native implementation for .NET, uh, Java.NET, C++, obviously in any Java language like Scala, and we have some of the interesting uh, implementations for the REST APIs, for the Memcached D, and whatnot. But fundamentally, that's kind of, you know, uh, what we have. The red size over here is what an enterprise version of the game gives you. Very quickly, I'm not here to uh, pitch the enterprise version, but we give you some security, continuous availability, management, um, best certification, all kind of high-level, high-end features. So this is basically what's under the hood, uh, and we'll talk about some of it a little bit more specifically. But before we jump there, let me just actually tell you what is there we've done for .NET. As I mentioned to you, from originally the project was developed in Java. The first version of that came out in Java, and still there's a Java project there as well. When we start thinking about a .NET, the first kind of you know, the first kind of idea was why we just develop the same small client .NET like we have in the REST API, right? Which will basically just call out and basically use the same REST API just to have a you know, .NET front end. And we had this for a while. And the problem was with that was that it was basically we're losing a lot of performance. It was not native app, and we know we just giving you .NET, you know, some kind of you know a hot baked way approach to use us and lose all the performance because of that. So. We kind of scraped that, and what we've done essentially, we developed the entire API parity of what we're going to discuss today, like compute grid, data grid, streaming, all the Hadoop and Spark things. We have entire API parity on .NET. We developed it from scratch. What we do essentially, uh, it's built and natively in .NET. What's interesting is that in order to not to, not to kind of a duplicate the entire logical core, we actually start the GVM inside of the .NET process. So we dedicate the entire logical things to the .NET, to, to Java implementation, so we don't, we don't have to repeat the entire project. But all the APIs, all the results, all the types are now basically .NET native. So you literally have almost zero performance loss in this scenario, and, and yet we get to reuse a lot of our core written in Java. The good news for you, for .NET guys, you're not even exposed to Java at all. You don't see a single Java interface, not in configuration, not in runtime, not in scripts, not in APIs, nowhere. If, you, if I wouldn't tell you we're starting a Java inside of the .NET process, you wouldn't even know this. So that's how we basically we completely natively uh, integrate with .NET. So we have, what I mentioned to you, we have a, almost an absolute parity between APIs. So whatever you can find in Java side, you can find in .NET. Whatever you find in .NET, you can find in Java, with a very few exceptions where it just doesn't make any sense. So in other interesting things, we have a full link integration. That's a pretty cool stuff. That's something Java doesn't have, by the way. That's one of this. I'm a big fan of Java and the whole kind of I'm a scroll guy. But one thing I'm missing badly in a Java ecosystem is something like link. Essentially, it's a strongly typed query language built, like, built into the language itself, like you know, your core language. In Java, we have, especially in Scala, we, we tend to have some kind of you know, a bunch of libraries from the same method, but nothing as clean as link as a link that is built into the .NET ecosystem. 
So we have full integration for that. So you can use SQL, you can use link right there. I actually have a bunch of examples there as well. Uh, we have full Java.net interop. That's a pretty cool stuff. It may not you know, be appealing to you guys if you completed .NET net shop. Um, but imagine this, you can have a cluster where you can have a bunch of Java nodes and a bunch of .NET nodes, .NET nodes and they're completely uh, working together. As a matter of fact, they can be distributedly, geographically distributed. You know, one cluster can be a Java cluster, another cluster can be .NET, they can all work part of the same larger cluster completely independently. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's not a single limitation where you can basically use only Java or only .NET. You can mix them, match them as you like. You know, it kind of gives you a nice, uh, nice idea. Some of the developers can work in Java. If your other group works in .NET, they can work in exactly the same project, exactly the same you know, concept. And you know, almost the same API, you just, you know, they just name it a little bit differently. But most of the time, they can exchange objects and everything else. So they can exchange. Um, um, let me actually jump back a little bit here. So when you, when you have a Java compute job, what's really cool, because we start the GBM within .NET, if you have a Java compute job, it can run anywhere. It can run on the Java node, it can run on a .NET node. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so it's basically can run on any C++ node. Obviously, .NET compute jobs can only run on .NET node. We don't start the .NET runtime in, inside the GBM. What really cool is uh, our integration with the binary serialization protocol. That's probably one of the most important things here. The bottom line is here. You can basically store object from .NET side and retrieve this object from a Java side. And we're going to convert all the types up to the property for you. You're going to have fairly complex, I mean, we're not going to convert all the types, obviously, if you have your own special type, we're not going to convert, you have to tell us how to convert. But we convert all the standard libraries for a collections and whatnot. We convert all between them, which is pretty cool. You can literally uh, have this interoperability where a hop team can basically work with a .NET objects natively in a .NET API. Other team or anybody else or legacy apps or whatever can basically retrieve exactly the same object on the Java side, work with it, put it back, and .NET can retrieve it back, and do whatever you like. It's completely transparently. So, that's pretty cool. Well, naturally, like we hosted the Maven on the Java side, we hosted a new gap on the .NET side. So if you guys want to start with a .NET project, very simple. One click button on the Visual Studio, you get the whole project. So, it's fully integrated. And what's really cool, I mentioned to you about that if you're in the .NET world, you don't really touch the Java side. That's really, you know, we really believe in this. So not even documentation, not in documentation, but configuration is also entirely .NET specific. So, like in Java, for example, you have to configure up through a screen and some out. So I was in, in the .NET world, they don't want to do that. It's not kind of your thing. So we have a fully .NET configuration. So you are completely shielded from <coughs> any kind of Java side artifacts at all. So if you're in the Java side, you really live in the Java side. If you're in the .NET side, you live in the .NET world. It's very important for us because we know how people feel about it. So it's pretty cool. So let me jump actually on some of the uh, meaty parts of what we do uh, as functional areas of the Ignite. Everything I'm talking today here applies absolutely identical to both Java and .NET. This you know, if there is any limitations, I'll mention to you. If I don't mention the limitations, it basically applies to .NET world entirely. So one of the most one of the most fundamental part of what we do is a clustering support. And I mentioned to you it's very important. Every single use of Apache Ignite, and we have, I don't know, we have thousands of projects. Uh, the Ignite is one of the fastest growing projects in Apache ecosystem, which we're pretty proud of. But in you know, almost every project we have, they use Ignite in a fairly distributed fashion. It's anywhere from two to three nodes for small testing, typically to 20, 30, 50 nodes. So, the clustering is extremely important. Well, what does clustering actually mean? It's a basically the ability to combine a bunch of nodes in the cluster and have it managed properly. So we have discovery, we have communication in the cluster, and fundamentally we support all types of clouds. We work on AWS perfectly fine, or Google Cloud, or just about to work on Azure. We work on Azure already for many years, but the work in Azure as a marketplace item. Uh, we work in any type of hybrid cloud installations, whether you have portions of your nodes, private cloud or locally, and portion for a burst out performance somewhere on the public cloud infrastructure. We work in this environment as well. Uh, we also have zero deployment functionality. I think, is zero deployment 
comply with that net or not? Probably not. Yeah. yeah, so this is one exception where the zero deployment actually available on the Java side. On the .NET, it's not due to different in terms of the class loading of Java and .NET environments. So that's where we dif uh, that's where we differentiate a lot. So we also have fully pluggable SPI based design. This is also pretty important for the industry. You can uh, think about Ignite as a kind of legal blocks. And we have almost 14 different subsystems that are completely pluggable. So anywhere from deployment to discovery, how most found each other for communication, to failover, the list goes on and on. Every one of them has to basically have an interface and implementation we supply, but you can take this interface, provide your own implementation, and all of a sudden you have network work very different way. It's a very unique ability, by the way. That's why you, uh, Ignite is really one of the, the only OEM friendly in memory system. Because a lot of our partners basically take grid game, change a bunch of plugins there, we'll call them SPI, service provider interfaces, and all of a sudden they have an Ignite that's completely their own. Their own communication, their own security, uh, their own ways how to deploy things and whatnot. Let me give you a couple of very funny, maybe not funny examples over the years that I've heard about. It. So one interesting example was uh, the company of Texas uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, they took Ignite and essentially re-implemented the entire communication over SMTP and POP3 protocols. Think about this. Why not? They have an entire cluster where nodes communicate over the emails. Another reason why? Because those emails go through a firewall, like a knife through the bar. You know, it's normal emails, they have the content, so they don't have to change any single security configuration in their system. It's obviously slower. I mean, it's a slower protocol. But you can basically make the whole of the night work over emails internally. That's how flexible it is. Another interesting example, we have come out of Germany uh, that used a um, 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 just giving the name uh, what's the protocol everybody using to download? Uh, torrent. So you use torrent for deployment. Think about this. So essentially anybody can post a job on the torrent and that system will take the job from a tour and execute on the cloud, I mean, on the cluster, and post the results back. So, it's a very kind of, you know, peculiar use case, but nonetheless, that's how flexible the system is. You can really mold it in any way you like it. So, and that's only two systems. We support the same pluggability for 14 different subsystems within Ignite. Almost every aspect of Ignite can be customized. You don't have to do it every time. But if you have, but if you want to, you can. You can, you can. It's a very unique capability of Ignite, and that's you know one of the reasons that it actually became so much popular. Because for a lot of different projects, that's actually very important. Sometimes you know our financial customers constantly want to add secure data encryption to communication protocols. We don't do it ourselves. We have the support as a sell as an option, but they have their own things and they constantly key manage and whatnot. And that's very easy to plug in what we do instead of basically rewriting the whole thing. So that's what clustering does for you. It basically, you know, provides you all this capability. How do I run Ignite on this laptop or on 20 laptops over here in this audience? It's very easy to do. As a matter of fact, if you know, we'd have like, you know, 10, 15 minutes, we can launch the entire cluster on this laptop right here. There's nothing to do, just download Ignite, start, 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 and it finds everybody connects to the cluster right there. Um, as a matter of fact, we typically do this when we do training. We just basically just bring up the cluster literally on this laptop you know, in about 10 minutes. So, in memory compute grid, by the way, there's a two major functionalities in our area, in memory compute grid and memory data grid. Those basically define almost everything we do. The rest of this, you know, is maybe less important. So what is a compute grid? Very simple. It's a very traditional high-performance computing. If you have a task that takes a long time, think about this. You can split this task in multiple subtasks. Execute those subtasks in parallel. Get the results back aggregate them and get your final result back again. In ideal use case, if you have an N nodes in front of you and you have ideal split, your overall task completes N times faster. That's the basic axiom of any parallel processing. Right? We've had it for literally 50 years. Right? So there was a countless number of implementations of the same idea. Hadoop, by the way, is one of them. It's a little bit different, you know, we have, you know, our, you know, we have more splitters, we have some sorting, but how many of the ideas where I said, how are I split and paralyzed in different ways? So, we happen to be one of the first a, on the Java side many, many years ago to really provide a very specific direct interface, how to do it in a very simple way. Today, we actually have in many ways to do 
a high performance computing or a compute grid as we call it. We actually pioneered this name and right now compute grid is kind of in a household name. Uh, so we have a uh, you know, direct interface for MapReduce. And we have actually almost three versions of MapReduce we support today. Our MapReduce and Memory MapReduce and uh, we support two versions of the Hadoop MapReduce. One in memory, one standard. So we have zero deployment, again, it's part, it's part of a Java only. We have a Chrome-like execution, obviously. You can have a task, you can supply some kind of schedule for it, and we'll execute that. We have state checkpoints. Now think about this, it's a very important, nice feature for a lot of folks who work in, <coughs> especially we've seen this a lot in the biotech. So if anybody working in the biotech, you guys know, almost everything you guys do takes like days to process. And you know, um, the state checkpoint on the compute job is a very unique feature. So think about this. If your job takes, let's say, a two hours to complete, and you try to debug it and it fails on you know hour 45 minute, what are you gonna do? You're gonna start over again and again spend this one hundred one hour forty-five minutes to get to the same point. What we allow you to do, you can checkpoint that running task, let's say every five seconds or every ten seconds. And if it fails, we're gonna restart that job from the last checkpoint we made. So it's a very nice feature when you're debugging something or running, you know. In algos that can fail to a certain degree. You can use our state share points and we can restart the same job when it fails somewhere else from the last checkpoint. Very, very nice feature for the long running jobs. Surprisingly, you kind of think about in memory computing, why the hell you have something like running line for hours? It was our opinion too, before a bunch of guys came to us from a biotech complex here in the valley and said, look, we're doing something and you know you guys spinning us from week to days, but it's still day of work of processing something, it's genome and everything else. And we developed this feature for them many years ago. So again, basically they can you know, effectively develop and debug those algorithms that take you know, that long time to process. So we still, surprisingly, for open source projects, we're still the only compute grade with the state checkpoints in the compute grade. So naturally we have a low bounce automatic failover. I'm not gonna go there almost. It's impossible to have a compute grade without that feature. So we have very comprehensive low bouncing capabilities. Uh, we obviously have automatic failover. Not only do we have automatic failover, we're actually giving you back ability to detect the failover and react to yourself in a certain way. Because there's endless ways how can you react to the failure of a distributed job, right? You can take the portion of the job, restart it again from different nodes, change parameters, set it back, endless capabilities. So we're giving you control how to do it. Uh, obviously providing some built-in stuff as well. So that's the compute grid, right? It's a basically idea of how to do high performance parallel computing. This is a very good example of how simple, by the way, this is a good example of um, how trivial can be. So this is basically what happens here. We're trying to calculate the number of characters in this string, right? Very made up example, but look how really simple it is. This is the entire code to run this job on thousands of nodes. Check this for a second. This is the entire code to run a fairly interesting job of calculating this length, obviously it can be anything, right? Uh, in parallel fashion. So what happened here, we take the words, we split them by space, right? And we create a closure uh, right here. And essentially uh, what we do is we get the compute engine and we apply this closure to these words and we basically give you the summation of the parts. This is your very basic map reduce processing, right? Very basic map and reduce processing. This is your mapping right here. This is your reduction right here. Do you see any other code to start the node, to send something over there, to wait for response? Nothing. Uh, and this is the bit, by the way, this is exactly the same, this looks exactly the same way in Scala and Java and UAL language. It's very much the same API. It's from the, that's why I mentioned the API parent. This is the entire thing you have to write, literally, remove the printouts. This is the entire thing you have to write to have a piece of code that automatically gets split in the large cluster, gets all the failover, all the load balancing, everything you can imagine, it gets it back. So naturally, this is the made up example for this, but imagine instead of this, this is, you know, a couple hundred megabytes, a couple of gigabytes. If you do it in a parallel fashion, now that actually starts saving your time. And if instead of basically doing a, uh, the length, right, like we do it here, imagine it's a little bit more complex processing, right? And you kind of, you know, whatever you can imagine, some polynomial algebra, you know, movie scanning, you know, 
you know, speech to text, any kind of NLP processing, all of a sudden, this parallelism, which will take exactly the same amount of line of code, which is like five, will get you tremendous performance benefits because you can basically easily parallelize. And that's obviously a very simple example. I'm not showing you all the you know, sophistication you can get with all the plausibility, with all the load balance, and the failover, and, and uh, adaptive splitting, where you can basically split based how much CPU each node has, how much RAM, how much statistics we accumulate. We can do all of this. But it can start as simple as this. Data grid. So talk about a memory grid, right? Uh, and memory compute grid. So compute grid is all about how do I parallelize my computations? So data grids is all about how do I parallelize data storage? The idea is very simple. Imagine I have a, a terabyte of data, and I have 10 nodes in front of me, and each node has only a 100 gigabyte of data. So eventually I have to split, right? I have to somehow split my data so I can keep it on the cluster. That's what data grid is all about. It's about how do I split, how do I partition this data somehow, somewhere, so I can keep it on the cluster. And naturally, there comes a whole bunch of questions. How do I transact? How do I query? How do I store? What happens if I add node, remove node? There's an endless amount of problems. Data grid is the biggest component we have, by far. This is the basic, probably, I don't know, 70% of a project is in the, basically, is in data grid. Everything else coalesce around this in terms of functionality. It's a very big piece. We can actually spend literally hours just talking about the features we have. I'll be pretty quick. Fundamentally, the data grid is a distributed key value store. It's very important to understand. It's very much the same approach like many of the NoSQL databases really take. Why? Think about this. Why do we talk about a key value store? The key value store is important because it's fundamentally the most primitive data store that can be molded into any view. Think about this. Key value can be viewed as a SQL database, can be viewed as a file system, can be viewed as a key value, perfectly fine. It can be viewed pretty much as any other data system, like a column database, for example, or not. So most of the system, including us, we are a distributed key value store when it comes to a data grid. We have essentially two different ways to store data, called a replicated and partitioning. Anybody actually familiar with Cassandra here? Cassandra? OK, somewhat. So that's where basically we're really different and better than Cassandra, because we have two distinct ways to store data. The first one is a replicated mode. Uh, and by the way, within an application, you can mix and match those modes as you like. It doesn't mean that the Ignite works in one mode or another. In Ignite, there is a cache, think of it as a table in database, and each cache can have a different mode. So what is the replicated mode? Very quick, in the replicated mode, the data is replicated entirely on each node. So each node has the same piece of data. You'll be surprised how often this is finally usage. Because lots of data sets are not big enough that they basically cannot be replicated on each node. But once you replicate each data set on each node, you get tremendous read capabilities. Because you can go to any node in the cluster for reads and read this data. So your writes become a little bit more, a little bit more slower, obviously, because once you do the write, if it's transactional write, you have to replicate it everywhere. But for the reads from all these systems, Especially for kind of you know a dictionary sense, like you know you, if you financial services, you know your your uh, your, your book of business, for example, or your uh, your prime server that, that basically kind of uh, contains all your you know your assets or whatnot or symbols. You know those things don't get updated every second. They barely get updated once a day, if ever. But they read on every transaction. So for those data sets, replicated <coughs> caches or replicated data sets are godsend because they're as fast as physically possible on that particular hardware platform. But the problem, obviously, is that they're, they're, they're as big as capacity of a single server, because the, the entire data set gets replicated everywhere. Another more frequently used storage mode is a partition mode. And that's basically where we're pretty much the same as Cassandra or anybody else who basically does on consistent hashing you know, ideas. Essentially, in a partition mode, we partition data set in parts and let each node keep only one part of that data set. So we're basically utilizing the entire capacity of a cluster. Now, there's a plenty of sophistication there. Naturally, we can have multiple A replicas of the same data for a consistent for a data durability. So typically, if the node goes down, if there's a one more replica, you know, we save, we don't lose the data. 
So typically, you can configure that, and our customers configure it with a two or three node replication would not. So, the typical question that I get asked, you know, what's a typical data size that is good for data grid? And my response here, anywhere from like zero, whatever you want to use, probably to tens of terabytes. That's our sweet spot. That's economical, that's something that we test very extensively. So, tens of terabytes is where we're basically saying this is the good spot for this. You know, we had some customers who basically go up. I don't think we have anybody who's doing the petabytes on this. And I think it's too expensive and just too unwieldy to steal in memory. But a tens of terabytes is the area that's basically perfect for that. Off heap and off heap storage. I don't think it applies to .NET, but it applies to Java side. Uh, we're going to skip that. Actually, you're right, you're right, you're right. The on heap does not apply, but off heap does. Um, if you guys, also applies. Huh? <laughs> I mean, data is stored. Like, I, I, I agree. I agree. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So fundamentally, idea is great. <laughs> it doesn't apply in the Java sense, but it applies in the .NET sense. But fundamental idea is this: that both the Java and .NET is, it's a runtime environment, it's right? CLR and HVM. So they both manage memory, right? Uh, and then typically, they all have the garbage collection, which basically starts killing you above a certain level. And uh, it's fine enough, I don't know how that you know, world reacts. In Java side, it's a major problem right now. Because 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when Java developed, it was not a problem. Because the heap was small enough that GC cycles could basically very effectively you know, clean up the, the, the heap size and not, not really affect any, any performance. What you have today, like 32 gigabytes of RAM on a typical laptop, and you basically Java chokes on anything beyond 10 gigabyte of OMP. It basically cannot effectively GC out more than 10 gigabyte of heat. So basically, if you have enough RAM, like 32 here or 16, you basically cannot use it because Java will literally chuck. And then typically, it will chuck entirely and will start slowing down anywhere between 7 to 8 gigabyte of RAM. So maybe CLR is different. I do not know. We didn't, and I don't really have the numbers to, to tell you, but you guys. You guys probably know better. Fundamentally, what we've developed is that we can develop our own memory management for the entire physical RAM on the box. So we can utilize the entire RAM on the box, no matter how much you have, because we manage our own memory within that. So we have our own heap, very small one, Java CLR, but basically manage our own physical RAM uh, on the box. And that basically gives you the ability to utilize the entire RAM storage, so simple as this. So we have high available, high available memory replicas. Again, it's a very technical term, but fundamentally the idea is that we can replicate the data on more than one node for data, you know, for data availability or for data durability. We have automatic fair lowering, whatnot, uh, load balancing, all this stuff. I'm not going to spend too much time. What's really unique about what we have for a data grid, we have a fully asset transaction support, and that's fundamentally different from from almost every other NoSQL database. Because most of those NoSQL databases have what? They have eventual consistency. And as Mike Stonebreaker says, you know, there's either consistency or no consistency. There's not, there's not, not a single thing like eventual consistency. Uh, you know, we took a very different approach. How many of you guys are actually familiar with the eventual consistency model? All right. So uh, I'm going to spend just one second on this because I think it's pretty cool stuff. <coughs> yeah. So when we start developing this, we start looking at the idea of how do we develop transactions. And everybody was doing EC back then. And the problem with the C is that it's, it basically trades, you know, consistency of the performance, but you can never get fully consistent with this. Even the full work, you, you can never get to the full consistency or guaranteed consistency. So a lot of folks basically bite this problem that you know they start using Mandram or Cassandra or uh, Couch, and they get to the point where they need to have like you know in 10% of use cases a full transactional behavior like normal database transactions, and they can't. So, and that's a very significant problem because, you know, in those 10% of use cases where you have to have transactions and you don't have them, you all of a sudden are left with development transactions, which is not a simple problem at all. So we took a completely different approach. We actually took an idea of a two-phase commit transactions and implemented the entire full two-phase commit transaction, which gives us a fully distributed asset capabilities. But then, we added a relaxation of the uh, asset properties to gain back speed. Probably confusing, but here's the end result of this. 
you can have normal transactions like your traditional database transaction, like two-phase commit transactions, fully asset, you know, basic transactions. When you don't have to have it, you can relax some of the properties on on a on a two-phase protocol and gain back full speed. But you still have normal two-phase commit transactions with the full asset properties when you need them. One example. If you look at the two-phase commit protocol, one of the biggest problems is a synchronous commit call, right? You have to prepare and commit. That's two-phase commit, right? First, second phase. The biggest problem in two-phase commit protocol is that your commit messages have to be synchronized. You have to send them and have to wait for response back to really you know, acknowledge that commit happened. That's the biggest, one of the biggest draw of performance for two-phase commit transactions. So what we allow you to do, we allow you to have a asynchronous commit calls. So yes, you lose, in theory, you lose consistency because you, sometimes, once in a million years, it may fail on this stage. It will not give you exception, but most of the time, it's not going to fail. It will not give you back this, uh, this, back this whole performance that we gain from not doing a commit synchronously. So that's one example of how basically we approach transactions differently from everybody else. I do believe that, in, in, believe me, you know, when we started doing this about seven years ago, it was a big risk because we were doing it a very different way than anybody else. In retrospect, now I think we actually did an absolutely correct decision because we now, the only product, think about this, about the only product in the market with a memory computer that actually has full normal transactions, optimistic, pessimistic, all isolation levels, read commit, read down commit, even serializable. With our system, you can have a serializable transaction. So you can really <laughs> lock everything, do something, unlock, lock everything again, and go on. So, for example, if you move money, you, you move accounts from systems. Sometimes you really, really want to lock everything down, so you don't have anything, you know, happening in the database. You can do it with our system. Uh, it's a very big deal because, again, if you don't have it, it's hard to develop. It's hard to develop if you don't have it. So we supply that. Anyways, and we also have SQL 99 support. So, and then I told you about key value store, how important it is to have, you know, this simple fundamental idea underneath of that. Because now we can basically give you a full SQL 99 capability on, an, on top of that key value store. Which is very cool capability. Think about this. You can put objects as an objects, like normal .NET objects into it. And then use link or SQL 99 interface to query this. And I always constantly get asked, why do you need SQL or link when you have a key value store. Think about this. And I always keep answering this question. If you have if you know your key, yeah, you don't need it. Get by key. But imagine but in all other cases, if you don't have a key, let's say you have a you have a query, let's say you want to find all you know all the employee organization with the first name in Kira. That's not the key, it's a query. What's the beauty of a SQL? It's indices. You know, if you don't have a SQL in indices of support, you do the full scan. Imagine doing the full scan on 20 terabyte of data. Even in memory, it will take you days, probably. So if you don't have an indices, which is, you know, if you don't have a SQL, you pretty much a limited to a very, very uh, primitive access pattern. You have to know the key constantly. You can never do any kind of interesting queries. That's why we developed the SQL 99 support for this. We have GDBC or GDBC driver, by the way. So both you know Java and, and uh, in the .NET world can use that properly, and uh, our SQL query is probably one of, one of the best. I can probably talk about it again and again, but uh, just the one idea we actually again one interesting implementation idea for a Ignite project. We decided not to implement our own SQL engine. Anybody who's done this in their lives know how hard it is. It will take you a freaking decade to optimize execution floor uh, and optimization and everything else. What we did, we took an H2 database that is local. It's a beautiful, small database, very, very effective, but it's localized. And we used this database on each node in the cluster. And we only added the distribution and optimization of distribution SQL logic on top of this local data databases. So each node has a local database that does all the last mile SQL optimization execution on each node. And we only do the distribution of the SQL logic. And for example, we do support distributed joins uh, quite effectively, especially if you use you know, a star schema for data, if you keep the metrics in different types of caches, partition and replicated. We can do distributed joins very well. As you guys know, distributed joins don't work in theory. Mm -hmm. There is no way to do it properly. Uh, so obviously there's a huge edge case where we don't work for the size. But if you keep the star schema in place, 
we can do distributed joins just as good as anybody else. And there's very few people who can do that. So, bottom line, in memory data grids, it's all about how to keep data in a fully partitioned parallel fashion. And how to access, how to transact on this data, and what's not. So, a couple of cool examples. Uh, this is very basic, just to get input. This is your key value access, right? So, ignite that create cache. You just create a cache right there called arc, and uh, just create inline objects right there with the name Apache uh, and tag private, and you can basically get this way when get the cache that get. Or you could basically uh, what's really cool about the remember binary objects. Mm -hmm. Imagine that this was stored from REST or PHP or Java or anything else. You can get a binary object exactly the same way from the same cache, and then you can interrogate this by a name and basically get the same name Apache here as well. So it's a very cool feature. You know, believe me, if you're really into the you know, kind of multi-language environment, this is a lifesaver. Because, this, because if not this, you have to use something like Trift and you know, really go through some bunch of hoops just to get the same thing. Here it's just built in. You basically can store this object from any environment, Java or .NET or C++ or anything you like. And you can basically get it locally like this, or you can get as a binary object and work with basically schema-less objects. One of the most important things we do is we support a schema-less object. So you can change objects on the fly, because obviously you can add fields and remove fields and whatnot, you can still keep them in the cache. It's very much the same as storing document objects, like for example in Couch to right? any, any document store would basically have the same idea, but a little bit more advanced. I mean, not advanced, a little bit more high performance than Couch, because obviously we outperform Couch by several orders of magnitude performance wise. But that's a different kind of project. So let me start with the example of the link query. Uh, this is the basic link query again. Uh, look how beautiful and integrated it is, right? So you basically get queryable interface back and you just say cache as a cache queryable. Wonderful where classroom link done. And this can be queried terabytes of data on a major cluster. You're not even aware of this. You basically write a very simple line of code like this and you get it. There's nothing to worry about how many nodes, where those nodes are, how they get connected, how do I do this. You get, a, you get basically a queryable interface that can basically very effectively uh, go in a for each loop and iterate over it if you like it. Or you can do whatever you like you know, with this result set. So that's the beauty of this. Um, and I'm pretty jealous about that that world. But they have the link and we do. Because in the Java world, that's actually a lot more ugly. <laughs> What's really cool here is that those types get checked, which is in Java world, uh -uh. you're basically out of luck. Um, I'm not even sure what the Scala libraries do. Have, I don't think there's a good. I don't think there's a good. There's nothing. There's nothing. Nothing as clean as this one. So you guys are lucky when you have this. So this is the beauty of this, and I like it a lot because that gives you a tremendous capability to really query very effectively. What do you want to query? If you want to use SQL, you can use SQL instead of that and have the support indices and everything else. You can define your indices. You can do all the proper things you can do in database, right? Uh, so this is pretty cool stuff. Again, I'm showing this very simple examples, right, of few lines of code. Keep in mind, this is the same code that works on thousands of nodes in the cluster. It works on one, on two, on thousand. It's absolutely the same code. It's going to work exactly the same way, just faster. Think about this. Think about service grid. Um, so this is another interesting thing. Uh, the service grid is essentially a, an automatic SLA management of objects in the grid. You know, it came from our customer support kind of, and the idea was like, guys, we already have an Ignite cluster. Can we like have some ability to have a like object that leaves based on some SLA, like only one in the cluster? If it dies, we're gonna start another one. And that's what we basically developed. You know, we have very nice ability, very um, Declaratively, you can say, hey, this particular service object, you can only have two instances of that on that cluster. And if the node on which the service is running dies, we're going to restart that service somewhere else. And you have all kinds of different capabilities. You can basically have a cluster singleton, which is a very cool thing, only one service instance in the entire cluster. We're going to manage this. You just tell us what it is, we're going to manage it ourselves. Node dies, we're going to restart it. You can have a node singleton. Just with one service on each node, no more, no less. We can have basically custom topology, which is very, very cool. 
you can define cast in the power say, hey, give me all the nodes with the RAM more than 8 gigabyte. Or give me all the nodes running Windows. Or give me all the nodes running Linux. Or whatever. Any kind of property. You can define this logical subgrid. And you can say, on that logical subgrid, I want to have only two services. And we're going to take all the pain out of maintaining this, this property, all the selling. Again, you'll be surprised how often you're going to use it. We're going to say, yes. So wait, in the case of a cluster singleton, what happens if there's a network partition? If there's a network partition, uh, it basically, Network partition is, is, is handled universally. Uh, we have a pluggable network partition detection. But bottom line, we're always going to pick one cluster that is basically considered to be correct one. Another one will be basically taken off, offline entirely. And we're going to continue with that cluster. So if the, if the service was running on the one that we actually removed, we're going to restock the one on the one that's left out. So. It's a good question, by the way. It applies to everything, by the way. It applies to computer to data grids everywhere. But we have kind of universal way of handling the partitioning. So you need node number and host. Huh? You need a node number and host. Oh? Why? Because if the network partitions, then it's not going to decide which one is it. We have a call back to you. You have to tell us. So that's why. That's one of the interesting I know, ideas we came up quite a few years ago. that. Yes, there's some ways to decide who is who is right and who is not, but we're giving you a call back and say, hey, because sometimes customers will tell us, hey, we know if we're in the right segment, if we can ping the router. So we don't know what the router is, right? We're giving you a call back and say, hey, ping it for us. Or can we ping a database? Or can we ping something else? So we're asking you, saying, hey, we have a partitioning, uh, not partitioning, we have, you know, a brain split problem right now. Hey, tell us which which uh, segment is correct. You tell us which segment is correct, we take offline the other one, we continue with this one. So we don't have the inconsistency of data or things like this in the, in the, in the service grid. So the system might It can be right away, yes. Okay. yes. Surprisingly, it's not something we're seeing very often. We're starting to see this with a new type of flash storage, because typically a flash storage like this network attached, it has special connectivity in the rack, and it's not locally. We're starting to see this. But up until this moment, we we don't have the same problem with Hadoop that needs to be record aware. But for something like distribution, like you don't want to put all the replicas on the same thing. You're right. That, that's what we have for sure. We can basically specify, based on IP, based on whatever, uh, we can specify that you don't want to be secure for something in a different place. We can do that. All right, string. It's another whole area that we have in the product. And now you guys are starting to see, right? Why I'm talking about data fabric. Think about this. Cluster, compute grid, data grid, service grid, streaming and CP complex event processing, all in the same product. That's, that's an idea of a fabric. You don't have to use all of it, by the way. Not a single client we have uses all of it. But it's kind of nice when you get the project, which is fairly complex like you might, right? It, it takes time to get into it. It's not a simple thing. But it's nice when you don't have to basically get another one for another task, get another one for another task, and get so on and so on. You basically get most of the use cases for memory from one project. Same documentation, same API, same configuration, same everything. So that's, that's the beauty of the fabric. So streaming. Again, what's the really big deal about streaming? Right? There is no beginning, there is no end. <laughs> that's the fundamental idea of streaming. Like in database, you have a table, right? This is bigger than this, can create a whole thing. In streaming, there's no idea like this. You never have a beginning, never have an end. So to typically, you process streaming by defining the window. That's a window-based processing. It's a very same concept used by every goddamn project in the streaming environment. Uh, from us to Spark streaming and everybody else. So we allow you to define a very fine window, which is a fully, you know, you define it. can be last five minutes, last five events, whatever you define. It's a logical window. It will allow you to define on that window a continuous query, which is, can be anything like link or SQL or any predicate based query. And a continuous query is a query that basically gives you a callback when there's a new data coming through it that spikes the query. Very, very nice, simple concept. So you can define your strings any way you like it uh, on a large cluster, define the window, and define a continuous query, and get a callback when something happens in the window that satisfies the query. Simple as this. It's a very fine concept. We're not alone doing this. Almost every other streaming project does it the same way. 
what we do essentially we integrate this completely with data grid and everything else. So not only can stream and filter this data, you can now store it in data grid, you can use compute grid to process it and go on and go on and go on. So very cool stuff. Uh, we actually continuously evolving this. You know, I think uh, what we have today is kind of like a second big version of the whole streaming and CP. Uh, but surprisingly enough, I, I looked recently at Spark. I don't know how much of a Spark usage you guys get in the .NET community. But I looked at the Spark, and as a matter of fact, I like our approach better. You know, we don't have this bullshit micro bashing that kind of you know complicates the whole issue. We have a very kind of simple concept. Here's your window, here's a continuous query, here's your callback. Once you have a callback, do whatever you like. We have a data grid, we have a compute grid, we have a Hadoop integration, do whatever you like. Whatever is the logic you want to do. And we actually, you, uh, we started to see a lot of use for that. You know, one of the prime uses for that is a, is a fraud detection. We have a number of projects and customers in the fraud detection. It's very, you know, obvious thing for fraud detection. There's a lot of transactions coming in. They constantly have to match that with the history, with some analytics, some statistical stuff. Very nice thing. They constantly filter this, and then they supply to different systems right away, and they did process it. No. So, so, so is this how you build what, uh, what subscribe? Yeah, you can do that. So, as a matter of fact, surprisingly, uh, streaming, some, you know, if you look at Lambda, Lambda architecture, streaming is not always about some external data coming. Yeah. Often enough, it's your internal data that is just easier to process in the streaming mm -hmm. concept. If you don't want to deal with, hey, where's the beginning, where's the end, how do I get all of it in one chunk? If you look at it, what people do in Lambda, they might say, look, we just, even internally, we're going to treat it as a stream. It's just easier to process. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot of this matter in this way. Even like it within the systems itself, mm -hmm. not internal, external. So, so there's no other publish subscribe? No, we, no, we, we basically, you know, for all of this, I always keep saying, use Kafka. Put Kafka in front of us, Kafka does all this buffering and you know, everything else. We yeah. try not to compete with Kafka. Kafka is an awesome project, uh, except for the reliance on the... Uh, I forgot the name of the Zookeeper. Zookeeper, yeah, the exact <laughs> <laughs> Try not to remember a piece of shit like this. But you know, yeah, except for the uh, Zookeeper, it, it's a wonderful project, yeah. which we, we use a lot, like, literally. Every second, every second project we have is used with Kafka somewhere. So that's so why we're that, that, just it. getting a callback when the event's evicted and pushing it to Kafka. No, no, no. Uh, Kafka, Kafka always sits, sits front and back. Yeah, back. Kafka is always sits in front of it, this whole oh. system. Because Kafka Central is a, is a, it's a, think about Kafka as intelligent buffer. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a very effective intelligence to buffer. Right? We don't want to buffer on our site. We want to get clean events, get through a filter, and then do something else with it, like process them. So Kafka is all about buffering. We're all about processing. And this is a very nice separation of the concern here, I guess. So this is maybe related. Um, so do you offer like at most once, you know, exactly once those kinds of semantics, or is the idea that if there's a failure, then Kafka is gonna handle? No, we do. Which one would we? I already forgotten. At least once. That's what because once most once exactly. is very hard to offer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, at least once we definitely do. Um, but, but remove repeatability is pretty hard. So uh, we probably got to rely on Kafka here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways. Well, Kafka is yeah, at least once as well. So you could duplicate through that. But since you've got indexes and everything, you could just build it. Oh, yeah. So examples were like, uh, yes, some of our customers basically implemented that. Yes. Uh, so they use Kafka as the as the, uh, uh, the source for the data, and uh, this data was streamed into Ignite, but actually to yeah to guarantee the exactly once mm -hmm. processing. The I'm sorry. Yeah. Exactly, exactly once. That's what I meant. Uh, oh, it's yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly once. once. It's yeah. 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 So anyway, this is a good example of how a simple it can be done. So you define a streamer with a cache, and that's it. You basically can do what you like. Just add data to the cache through a streamer. Uh, obviously, it's all distributed, so you can have as many nodes as you like with the different with the same streamer, and all they're going to basically be adding stuff into the uh, into the cache. That's not a window, but you know, just an example of the streamer itself. Okay, that's running on the node without you doing anything at all. Right? We're not getting a callback in this instance. We're just. Do you about this example also? No, this example is basically just a 
base extreme example, not the rollbacks here, not the ones. No, but so the actual computations running on the node as the stream events coming. They can be, yes. Uh, the whole idea. Typically, that's how it's done. This yeah. is not the example, I'm sorry. I probably should have put a better example. No, so, so you don't need to have a callback back out to your. No, 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 no. no. They're right on the node itself already. Right. Uh, one of the ideas that you know you see a lot in Ignite is the we're trying to minimize any movements of anything. Mm -hmm. So always everything runs in the same process. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you have to move, you have serialization and serialization network, which kills you like immediately in performance wise. So most of the time you're gonna see us trying to collocate as much as possible everywhere. And we have special collocation for data group and whatnot. That's a little bit more sophisticated topic. So let me be very quick because I think you guys are you want, to, you want to take a quick 10 minute? Mm. I have about three slides more. Oh, then you're done? Yeah. Well, then you guys decide. You want to just have, keep marching through? Sure. Then let's do yeah. it. Yeah, I have about like literally three or four slides. So, okay. very quickly, <clears throat> Hadoop acceleration. Um, how many, uh, are you guys like, you know, how many of you guys use Hadoop in that matter? Well, used to. So, I don't, I don't think there's like a. Anyways, I'll be very quick because I know it's not, maybe it's not a, a hardcore subject for you guys. But, but essentially, you know, what we've done, you know, we'll, how can we speed up Hadoop? Hadoop is part of which defense and network is like two components there, right? Storage, processing. So fundamentally, what we develop, we develop in memory HDFS, in memory Hadoop, in memory methods, I'm sorry. Pretty cool stuff. Um, in itself, we have in memory HDFS, which is a cool thing. It's one of the first HDFS compliant in memory file systems. Think about this. Uh, Bona fide file system. Mm -hmm. Open file, close file, write, read through it's a normal file system that lives entirely in RAM on the cluster. By the way, this is yet another view of the same key value store. Remember I told you about it. That's the coolest thing about a key value store. You can really mold it into very different ways. File system is one of them. So if you just want to have a file system in RAM, there you go. You just mount it and open file, close file, read it, it's right there. It's a normal file system. As a matter of fact, we have a a beautiful file manager right built into the our management console. Is that Windows as well? Huh? Windows Server as well? It works on your, it will probably not mount on Windows right now. I don't think we have a mountable point on Windows. But you can you can basically have it like within the cluster itself in the file system. As long as the cluster leaves, the file system leaves as well. But What's GTFS? It's a great game file system. Oh, that's the yeah. in memory one. Exactly, yes. So, again, if you know anything about it, you know, Hadoop, Hadoop is extremely put it politely, strangely system, but uh, so fundamentally all this gray area arrows is exactly what happened in Hadoop execution flaw. That's why it takes freaking forever to launch anything in Hadoop, right? Even if you launch like an empty job, it takes like five seconds or 10 seconds to do anything. So there's a job tracker, right? The, the Hadoop line connects the job tracker, and the job tracker has a, you know, a single point of failure with the name node, which is your metadata file system. Then there's a Hadoop tr task tracker, and then it spins out the a GVM process for every goddamn job that it wants to run, so it's like the whole rigmarole. All we do is this in our implementation. <coughs> so we bypass everything that exists here. We do from a grid gear or whatever, Ignite client to a, a Ignite data node on GTFS, and we do this question right on spot. So bottom line, it's all built in. I'm not going to spend too much time, but here's a, here's a pretty cool stuff. Download Apache Hadoop. Stuck. Just from Apache, run a, an example, like for example, Pi calculation. It has a right, built in Pi calculation example. You know, it runs like for a 30 seconds. Uh, download Apache Ignite, install it along the lines. Don't do anything except one change, just a change configuration. Don't recompile, don't do anything. Run exactly the same example, five seconds. Think about this nothing to do, nothing. No recompilation, no nothing. Just installation. Five seconds versus 30. So that's what we do for Hadoop. Use quite a lot, by the way. Pretty cool stuff. The last slide I have is the last slide. It's about Spark. Uh, that's kind of a question for you guys. How many of you guys actually heard of the use Spark in .NET ecosystem? <laughs> What's actually there for .NET and Spark? I haven't looked. Just not like files in the place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately it is, but you know. Surprisingly, because that's actually one of the one of the better projects in the Java ecosystem that you know simplifies a lot of machine learning, if you know. So, anyways, you know, if you know anything about Spark, Spark is a processing engine that has zero storage capability, right? It's a processing framework. So, and that's what basically people start to kind of feel. 
that you know I can load a bit of a data into it, process, get results back. But what if I need to keep something in it, right? Mm -hmm. What if I have multiple jobs? Where do they keep results between those jobs? Mm -hmm. And people constantly drop in those intermediate results, something like an HDFS a file system, which kills the entire purpose of even the processing. You know, very fast job and like slow story in the file system, reading back and then quick job again. What's the point? So we develop a very cool thing. We develop essentially a what's called in memory RDD. RDD stands for resilient distributed data set, which is the which is the idea of a small component of data within Spark. We develop the RDD that is fully distributed and stays in memory. It's a very cool idea. So basically if you have multiple Spark jobs in a, in the pipeline, now you can basically pipe the result of one job into the in memory RDD and let other Spark job read from this RDD. This dot will stay in memory across the cluster so to be basically alleviating the whole problem of not having storage in Spark. So very popular project, really makes Spark you know, shine. Because all of a sudden now you have a storage, uh, you can keep your intermediate results in, in memory and basically uh, work with Spark very nicely. So as you can see, this is another kind of you know, a story <coughs> or a component to a story about us being a fabric. We have so many different things we can do for a memory, right? I'm just kind of cap this out. So we can do clustering, we can do compute grade, you know, we can we can do data grades, service grades, streaming, Hadoop and Spark acceleration and integration. So that's what the idea of a fabric is, where it's coming from. But all these capabilities right there in a single project. So this is the last slide I have. So I promise you not to torture anymore. If you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Yes? Is there anything special for wide area distribution? Here's the problem. If you have a, a parts of your node locally and parts of your node in a WAN, yep. your latency is a certain amount of different. Yes. So we have to be as slow as the slowest component. Um, so you can define your own DPN over this and run it. But be prepared that it can be as slow. But, but like if we're looking for a fine map. Oh, we, shattered, that, we, we shattered the system so that you know, this one's primary, so, this one's primary, for that shard, and now we want to replicate Yes, so for that, uh, in the enterprise version uh -huh. of Ignite, we have this replication, okay. both in you know, active, 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 passive. So for that, we have, but that's the price feature, it's yeah. not part of Ignite. All right, guys. That's cool. Thank you very much. One more question. Uh, regarding the uh, consistency of the consistency of the base coming, uh -huh. uh, you mentioned that. Uh, have a asynchronous call, so colleagues are waiting for the full implementation. As an option, yes. Because that's an option, right? So of course, we have a full. Have yes, we have a full base commit, which is uh, If you want to get more speed, you can basically make the commit based asynchronous. You lose, in theory, the consistency, but you get a lot of speed back. It's one of the biggest drawback of the base commit is a weak commit message. Yes. And once you enable it, it's going to be for everything, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a normal transaction. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we have you a lot of things. Yeah. Let me tell you this: we have largest banks in the world, anywhere from Citi, Wells, Barclays, Fairbank, using us for a full transaction management. So, believe me, they busted our balls in a big way, it's just testing all our transaction capabilities and. <laughs> Turning off computers in the middle of everything and everything else. We passed all of this. You can always, uh, it's, you can always have a different configuration for different uh, yes, absolutely. APIs, right? Absolutely. So you can have certain, like, as you mentioned, like you know, it's only ten percent of those cases which really require uh, full consistency. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Every cache, every cache, which is a like basically logical subset of data, can have completely different configuration, different transactions, different. Areas. So you just you, you decide what you want to do. You have one message track. Okay. Uh, typically, our customers would have like, you know, dozens of different caches, so to speak, where they can take them to different. But with the, with the same cache, uh, you know, the, the producers that are in case you can produce and all of that is, is really the critical data which you want to have it as a consistency. So the remaining things you want. Uh, can you have it so that the, the, the client, one of the clients handles the critical aspect and you have other remaining clients which sort of reads 
or yes. does it think on the same cache? Yes, definitely. Like I see what you're saying. saying. Yes, yes, we can. It may not be one liner, but you know, there's definitely API for this. I just don't know, can we like have a different uh, transaction configuration with it on with the cache? Or not? I think the cache it's so you I mean yeah, you can define basically you can define the isolation for a transaction. And per transaction. transaction. Per okay. transaction. So it's not per cache. So you have a default configuration for the cache and you can override it for it. For each transaction. We also actually we also have an atomic cache. It's like a, it's a cache which basically doesn't support transactions at all. So it allows you to only to update individual keys, uh, but it's generally much faster because it's just an atomic update of a single entry. Like your cache updates. Yeah. So what is the project in terms of like the Apache kind of project we're a top-level project. We have a distinction that we're probably the fastest behind Sparkle yeah. from a from incubation to field. Yeah, but look, we all been in Apache for about two years. Keep in mind, the project's been open source for different licenses for over ten years. So we are very mature for uh, Almost every firm in the Wall Street uses us in one capacity or another. Let me tell this. Based on our stats, uh, the Ignite node starts every second around the globe today. So it's a fairly good project. By the way, anybody interested in joining our project? Obviously, it's an Apache. It's a meritocracy. Yeah. Join us. Look at what we do. And join our DevList, by the way. If you just don't want to do anything, just want to see what's happening within DevList. All, that can, all our discussions about design and future happens in open. You guys want to know what's happening in the projects? What what's the major you know pain points or directions we're going? It's all free. So definitely, it's an Apache for Ignite. Take a look. Yes, I'm kind of new to all of this, but where? I mean, I, I understand basically processing data. Everything's all in memory, but you've got to persist it somewhere. Is that serialized from a database and then in the background written there, so you've got a persistence, or does this system? Supposed to never go down, and and you know how is that? You know how. Here's a question. You know, funny enough, we have plenty of plenty customers who have no uh, no persistent storage whatsoever. They perfectly fine in event of I don't know whatever nuclear war to lose the that, <laughs> and they perfectly know that unless there's a war, nothing's gonna be lost because they're like you know, three copies everywhere, and those are you know reliable hardware. So, yes, there is a plenty of other customers like banking and they said, no, 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 no. We have to have an Oracle in behind of this. So, we have either, you know, asynchronous or synchronous sync with a database where we have that. Where we have Some background or this. Yeah, there's multiple options there. But you'll be surprised, you know, how many, I would say, majority of our use cases where people don't, I wouldn't say majority, let me just rephrase that. Probably half and half where people do not have any persistent store whatsoever. They keep it in RAM, it's perfectly fine, it's very stable. Uh, we have all the options for durability in RAM by replication. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly fine. What if you decided we've got to take the system down? Do you serialize all the data out and then serialize it back in when you come back up? Or, you know, that's that, that's got to be a long process. That's it's, it's, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. If you have a use case like this, uh, then I would recommend to have at least local recoverable storage, so our option in the price edition. We're basically on each node, we utilize local flash storage, presumably, or it could be a flash spinning disk, to constant to basically copy the RAM component to the disk very effectively through a map, map, map files. Mm -hmm. So we have that as well, if if that's the case. But again, it's it's a minority of use cases. The majority basically is where people have database already and they basically literally write through this and use this as a cache essentially, effectively. Or they they have no storage whatsoever. They use this as a basically in RAM system of records. You'll be surprised. I mean, it, it, it feels a little bit unnatural because what happens if I power down everything, right? Mm -hmm. But then think, well, how often do you power down the entire freaking data center? Not very often, unless there's like a war or something. Like really. Yeah. You, so you think it will still need, but you know, there's a plenty of use cases where that's not a real threat. And you gain a lot of productivity, a lot of performance by not concentrating on that. 
Yes. So I have two questions. The first one is, uh, you mentioned uh, Ignite can store um, sort of CLR objects. How do you deal with like different versions uh, of the same application, the same object running? So is version information persisted with the object, or sort of you have to be careful to make sure things are compatible? Uh, so basically, yeah. So basically, the binary protocol uh, allows you to. So the main feature of the binary protocol is that it allows you to look up the field by the name without actually knowing anything about the schema and without deserialization. So basically, we store everything in the binary format. Uh, and when you get the object, you just get the latest uh, version of this object that is stored by that key. So if you like add a field to that object, it will be added to this particular object. And all other objects of the same type will just have less fields. And if you have new class definition on your client, and you get like an old object, uh, the object of the older version, uh, basically this new field will be null or just default value or whatever. So it's not actually a CLR object. It's in the binary uh, format. Of it's sure what you refer to document so mean by CLR, CLR object. CLR. You can have the class on the... Uh, yeah, in but, the, in but, the but it's not a .NET object. It's a Ignite binary protocol. Yes, it's stored in cache in binary form. It's actually applicable both to Java and .NET and right. any language. So we always store everything in binary format and you never have to have classes on the server nodes. You always have them, have them on your clients. You if, can, you, if you have them, you can even avoid having classes so, at all. So to convert it back to a class is a serialization? Yes. If you convert it to the class, that's the right. deserialization, yes. But even if uh, your class if, uh, has like the different version of the object itself, mm -hmm. it will be transparent to deserialize. So if there are no fields in your class, they will be just ignored. If there are uh, fields in your class that are not an object, they will have, mm -hmm. just have default values. Um, the second one's a bit of a maybe dumb question. You mentioned star schema helps you when you're doing uh, distributed Jones, joins. Right. Can you just, like, what, what, what is a star schema? A star schema is basically where you, it's like from a lab world, from data warehousing, where you keep dimensions, facts and dimensions separately. Right, there's a fact, there's a dimension, like, you know, uh, I don't know, product name. And then there's a facts, basically those actual product names, right? So in a, in, a, in a data warehouse, when you get a cube of a data, right? That's why you separate it. facts and dimensions, or dimensions and facts. And if you have the same schema for, I mean, if you keep your data in the star schema, so you partition your data into the dimensions and facts, you can keep your dimensions in the replicate cache and your facts in a partition cache. I know it's complicated. But the way, mm -hmm. once you do this, you the biggest problem with distributed joints is the uh, keys exchange. You have to be, if you have 20 nodes, mm -hmm. you have to exchange all the keys between all the nodes. But if you have a star scheme, you can optimize this because your key exchange becomes a lot smaller. So we still work even without the star scheme. We're going to work. We're going to work slow. There's, it's, you cannot change the laws of physics. Yep. You can ex you need to exchange all the keys everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, think about this. Why do you think Oracle never came up with anything other than basically two or three nodes? Because, because of this problem. Oracle has a brilliant engineers, but this, it's, it's an axiomatic. You cannot do this. That's why SQL databases do not scale without some trickery. One of the tricks is the star scheme. That allows to have very effective join. On the flip side, you have to work about the star scheme storage. Right. So there is just, you know, there is no universal way of doing this. So, but we support both ways, and we smart enough to take advantage if you have a star schema, uh, where it will work fast. Simple as this. Will you keep the, the, the how uh, when you do partitioning, uh, um, and if you are going to create something which needs to kind of scatter further, uh, who is the driving? I mean, you have, are you, each, is, is each of the node aware of what other nodes have when you when the data is partitioned? You mean uh, how do we collocate the right property? Is that what you're asking? How do we collocate the... If the... When the data is partitioned, like right, instead of right. replicated in all the nodes, yes. the data is... Yes, uh, essentially think about this. Uh, we know, given the key, we know where the, where the data is located. And where the, how do you guys know? Who, who, does, who knows that? Uh, who 
it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. We actually have we have a stateless function that's responsible for that. Uh, we use a variation of um, what's the name of the algorithm? You remember? Random regression. Yeah, random regression. It's a fancy mm -hmm. name, uh, but we use random regression for this. So basically, uh, it's a different it's a different concept than consistent hashing used by Cassandra, for example. And what allows you to have essentially have a function where you can basically it's a stateless function. That's why it's everywhere. You don't have to maintain the state. Given a key, it tells which partition it basically it lives on. Mm -hmm. And knowing partition and another node. So and that can change to I mean the, the it can change can from one node yes, to the other. Yes, it can. It can. So then maybe when there's node added or nodes removed from the topology, it will change minimally. And this function will tell you right away too. So uh, the bottom line, in any given amount of time, knowing the key, you can know exactly where the the data for that key is residing. So if you have a set of keys, you can call a key the function that needs to process the set of keys with the with the with the node where the set of keys resides. If it's a one node, and we allow you to have them, you know, we allow you to group those keys on one physical node if you need to. And if you lose a node, then there's a of course, yes. Yeah. It's automatic rebalance. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. I think Tanya will do the ruffle.